Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Evan Radisic. I'm the Managing Director of the Cloud Software Association. And uh, today we have with us Ashley Hildreth from, uh, from Clyde. So um, Ashley um, has been, has been uh, around the block for um, you know, quite a few years, and she's been a, a loyal CSA member for, for a, um, quite a few years, actually. Um, she comes from Trustpilot, where she built a really successful agency program. Uh, she's just recently moved to Clyde. Um, she's going to share some, some tactics, um, some go-to-market strategies for, for engaging with agencies, which can be challenging. So I won't get uh, too into it. I'll let Ashley do a little intro. And uh, just remember, like these, these things are supposed to be kind of interactive, so it can be a little awkward with Zoom. But just if you have a question or you want, you want to stop and kind of talk about it, something that's been presented, just jump in there. There's no unawkward way to do it. So just get in there. Anyway, Ashley? Um, over to you. Cool. Yeah. And like I said, feel free to chime in if you want to like just raise a little virtual hand or pop something into the chat like that works too. Um, I don't want to just sit here and preach about agencies to everyone, although I'm here to do that. So um, let's keep it, you know, conversational. Um, so for for this session in particular, I know that we probably have a lot of folks in the room that are in various stages and levels of maturity in their partnerships journey and careers. Um, so one of the things that I was hoping to, to do today is to get like more tactical. I think we can all agree that like agency partners are really important. Sometimes they can be tricky to work with. Um, and I think there's some general like high value um, like about high, high over high level overview, like value props that we can all agree upon. But I kind of want to get into the weeds a little bit um, and talk about some of the tactics that I uh, deployed while I was at Trustpilot, some of the things that we're going to be doing at Clyde with the goal of trying to like get things done quick. Um, so just like at a show of, just by like a show of hands or maybe even like a virtual hand, like um, how many, folks in the room are just like focused particularly on agencies or are you doing like other channel stuff? Like are you doing tech partners and agencies or is everyone here just agency? I guess raise your hand if you're just agency. <laughs> <laughs> little, little bit of everything. So like it, for everyone else in the room, are you also doing tech partners or um, I guess tech partners too? Yeah. Awesome. So I, um, I recently joined Clyde. I've been with the company for about six, six months. God, that went fast. Um, prior to that, I was at a company called Trustpilot, uh, which is a global online review platform. In both roles, I have done everything partnerships. So not only agency, but also technology partners as well, as well as like strategic alliances. And so one of the things that like really excites me about agency and one of the things I was really pushing for when I joined Clyde is like, how impactful and how quick we can be as partnership people to really like launch an agency program. Tech partners are kind of like you can stumble around with them. It takes a while. You need resources from other departments. You kind of sometimes put in a position where you need to beg, bar, and steal to be able to like deploy some of those strategies. And so with agency, I think we can really actually own a lot of what we need to do to be able to, to launch that program. Um, so before jumping into things, I'm just going to share my screen and give everyone the opportunity. Does anyone want to ask any questions or raise any topics that you were hoping to get from today's session? That's okay if you don't want to. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speak up. This is Bradley. Um, so as you know, actually we dialogued yesterday. Uh, for me, it's some of it is, is forecasting, like what are realistic expectations? I know things like run the gamut, but when we talk about agencies, my I'm in the SaaS world. So that's what I think about when I think of agencies. And so it is a question of um, forecasting how many agencies are practical. You know, I think I suspect a lot of us I'm trying to keep things beneficial for all here. You bring on an agency, then then what? what's involved to, to ensure they get ramped up and you know is it what's in what's the level of expectation in terms of when they bring on their first client right is it is it immediately is it 30 days 60 days 90 days and beyond and what's an and i think another thing would be is just you know what's what's an expected is it like sales in terms of you know, how many the question is how many agencies can be brought on board on a monthly basis and, and is it done strictly by you know with outbound effort. 
I'll start there. <laughs> so it sounds like KPIs um, yep. pertaining to agencies um, and how to set expectations within the org as well. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to uh, jump in. Hi, Ashley. Uh, thank you so much uh, for doing this. Um, I was super interested, well, just not only in hearing, of course, your tactics and what you put in place, but also um, particularly in your outreach and outbound efforts um, for recruitment of agencies. Um, I was really interested to know, like, what have you found works and ideas and strategies in that way? Great. We've got a couple of slides on that. <laughs> awesome. Um, anyone else? I'll just jump right into it. Ashley, I love, I love the first line that you opened up with the, uh, it, I just wrote it down, like, you know, with agencies, uh, we can all, we can kind of own what we need to do. Um, I think it's a pretty powerful statement. It's because a lot, with a lot of people I find, um, you know, it's, it's just such an unknown where it's like, oh, I'm working with like 30, 40, 50 agencies across the board. And it's like, they're all different size agencies. They're in different, maybe different country. And it's like, it, it, there's so much unknown as to like what those tactics are to kind of activate them and they feel like it's completely different for every single one so like it's a pretty powerful statement i'm kind of very curious to see kind of what what, what some of those tactics are so dig in cool awesome um so i guess i just want to share a little bit of, of background on um what my part my journey in partnerships looked like because i think that some of the tactics that I was able to do uh, early on, like I didn't have a whole lot of buying power within the org. So I had to get like scrappy. Um, and then obviously as like I matured in my role, I got more buying power and more resources once we were able to prove out uh, the concept of what the impact of the agency partnership channel looked like while I was at Trustpilot. So just to kind of dial back the clock, I actually joined that company as an account executive. So I was part of the new biz team um, and I had done so done pretty well in that role. So I was there for about eight months, nine months before I decided that I wanted to explore a role in channel and had the opportunity to work really closely with our enterprise sales team. Um, and so in that with that opportunity, you know, like I said, I had to get scrappy and we had like no partners at the time. So it was like, how are we gonna go about finding out which partners are going to be really good fit for us? Define what that ideal partner profile looks like. And then what does that outreach and onboarding plan also then look like to follow in order to be able to one, deliver a really positive experience for those agencies that they want to work with us and we don't become like any kind of burden or adding extra work on their plate. And then two, how are we gonna be able to show um, success both to the partner, but then also internally being that I was new hire, new partnerships hire um, number one. And I knew that this was a channel that I wanted to build and grow within the org. Um, so from there, I you know, started to build, a, build out the team once we proved out the concept um, and where I really start to see the partnerships org really start to flourish was when I was able to um, have some additional members of the team that supported us. So partner marketing was a huge come up, um, being able to help develop, deliver on content and to be able to support partners. Um, and then a solutions engineer that was also help, help available to help with like onboarding and all the technical aspects of supporting partners um, when they wanted to get into the weeds with us. So now here I am at Clyde and so I'm building out the agency partner program. Um, agencies for us, are digital agencies and SIs that build more, more often than not build um, stores on like Shopify, Big Commerce, WooCommerce, Magento, etc. Um, but then there's we also work with digital marketing agencies who focus more on like the top of the funnel. So these are agencies that you know do pay per click, SEO, email marketing, social, etc. And we have arrived at that based on looking at what is Clyde's, or even in the case of Trustpilot, um, what our ICP looks like and what are some of the, cost, the, the partners that are around their sphere um, to kind of drive how we were going to approach uh, procuring new partners. Um, so step number one, 
Um, I put together a quick little checklist of what like an MVP could look like for day one on the job. Like what are some of the things that we need to like kind of get the shop in order before we start to go into that like partner acquisition mode um, with just like with a very slim view of like the, the to do's that we need to, to do. So one is defining that ideal partner profile. To establish your program goals, and we're going to jump, jump into some of these pieces as well um, in more detail uh, further along in the conversation. Um, three legal docs. Get together a lunch and learn deck and some really basic collateral so that like once you start like reaching out to partners, you have some content that you can start to reflect on and leverage in those calls. Because one of the things that you don't want to get into is like where you start to pick up conversations with new agencies. And then you also have to develop content on the fly. Like that's where we start to suffer a slow death of a thousand paper cuts because we're trying to like support, onboard new partners, support new partners, build content for them. And then like and all of a sudden as partnerships people, we are you know, super cross-functional cross, -function, cross uh, functional as like a breed, I guess. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's hard to keep track of all the things that we need to do. So just getting like some of the basics done early on um, before, you know, really making the push to sign up new partners makes life so much easier. Um, and then lastly, on the infrastructure piece, like really making best friends with the sales ops team and figuring out how we're going to track attribution, deal registration, um, because after year one, we want to be able to look back and say, here's where we started and here's where we are. And um, not only like you need to make sure we're able to drive the proper commissions and attribution for partners, but then also like to continue to promote the value of the partnerships org uh, to the business. Anyone think there's anything that I missed in the infrastructure piece? Okay. Um, and then like prep work. So getting to better understand one, like the the org so if you're new i don't know how many folks here are new to their roles or to their companies but for me like i joined i joined clyde and i was like oh god i need to know this product inside and out at first like that was my knee-jerk reaction but then i realized you know what i don't need to do that i know partnerships i know what i need to do to launch the program the product knowledge will come and you have people that work alongside you whether they're in sales or cs that can help to support um you in the conversations with partners once you get there so like my advice is just don't get too lost in the product sauce because like that will come um but like as a long-term goal i think it is really important for for us at least at least within clyde and with while i was at Trustpilot, for us to be product experts um so additionally like like I said, making really good friends with the folks in sales and CS. Um, and then like checklists also starting to figure out like who are some of those partners that you're going to pursue like early on? Um, and how are you going to be able to manage your time as you're trying to get all this stuff in place um, before you start to go into acquisition mode? All right, so Brad Bradley, I think this is probably um, relevant to you uh, as you're trying to figure out what like the ideal partner profile might look like. And so one of the things that, you know, I really needed to figure out at least at Clyde was like, all right, well, how many deals do we need to win from partners in order to make the juice worth the squeeze? Um, are we going to be taking like a volume based approach where we want to sign up a ton of partners because like we have a really transactional sale or we have a product that could be self serve potentially so the more partners we get the more volume we get and then like the faster we can you know, prove out the concept and prove out the ROI versus I think there's other partner programs and partner approaches where you know, it's a, it's a much more strategic slower sale and you don't need a ton of partners you just need a couple of really good ones. And so while I was at Trustpilot, like we actually started with the, the latter. So it was like sign up a couple of partners, win a couple of deals per quarter. And like that was enough to be successful. And then as our product matured, as our organization matured, we like increased our sales velocity and became much more of a transactional sale. And we had to reflect that 
within um, the partner profile that we were working at. And so while those early on partners that we brought on um, in the early days of the, of the agency program became some of our most successful partners, um, they still didn't have enough clients for us to be able to onboard enough deals to be able to meet you know, the quotas and the expectations from leadership. So we had to pivot. Um, so before I move on to the next thing, Bradley, I know this was a, a hot topic for you. Is there anything that you want to unpack or get a little more um, specific on? You're muted. You're, not, you're, you're muted. Uh, there you go, Bradley. There we go. Sorry about that. Classic uh, Zoom mistake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get old. Really. <laughs> and you see the memes about it too, right? Uh, so, when you're starting out, I mean, there is some element, I would say maybe whether you're volume or strategic, it's, it's, you know, do you, how fast do you go just to learn from each one? Like early on, like how, yeah. how many partners you want to talk to? Right. Right. For front. example, like if you're saying, all right, let's go for volume. Okay, and then you're like, okay, well, let's go for strategic. Okay, then there's still a question of, well, how many do we need to go after on a monthly basis, right? And and what's what's the, what should leadership's expectation be, right, uh, in order to close X number of partners per month, if you're going after volume and and or if you're going after strategic. Does that make yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And I think, you know, like I was saying uh, yesterday, I think there's a way to do this with math. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so for, for me, I think trying to, to temper expectations by looking at like, what is the current, what is the current sales team doing? Because as, as the value of the partnerships channel is that we have, we're basically hiring external sales reps without doing so. Um, and so we're creating a whole new workforce of sellers to introduce new business uh, to the company. And so <clears throat> for me, if I'm not able to sign up enough partners that they're able to outperform a sales rep, then that's a problem. Um, unless they're, they're, you know, the deals are just much higher and I don't need to close that much more because we're delivering like higher intent opportunities. But um, one of the things that, you know, I think we were running through is like how many deals are expected from one sales rep? And then from there, how many agencies do we need to do? Do we need to sign? And what does that profile need to look like? And how big do their portfolios need to be in order to be able to contribute the equivalent value of at least one rep? And then figure out, all right, well, based on those numbers, how many reps do I want to be? Do I want to be a whole team? Do I want to be a whole org? Um, that can help you do a little bit of backwards math to start figuring out how many agencies and what size they need to be in order to you know, dictate what those, those numbers of new partners that need to be acquired would look like. That's a, yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good way of putting it because I agree. Like it's, it's, you know, when I was uh, proposify and we're kind of onboarding agencies, like you, most of them were interested, right? So it's about the alignment part of it and expectations. It's like, do, are they expecting leads? Are they like, why are they joining? Are they joining because they have five customers that they know that could um, benefit from this? Like they know they can add on their services. Like, what is the alignment and the, the better fit that is the more certainty you have that each additional partner you have is going to actually deliver right so you know do you like my question for you Ashley is like on that like initial filter like where they're applying you know there's a certain amount of automation where it's like hey fill out this form like for basic alignment to make sure that you know the expectations are there before somebody jumps on a call with them like, how, like, can you just talk a little bit about like that filtration process? Like, are you getting on a call on every single one and making sure that there's alignment? Like what level automation on that filter do you want? Like how much time do you, like, do you spend and how important do you think it is to find that alignment early on? And then like, once you have alignment, you know exactly where they need to be, 
yeah, it's a formula that we can figure out what the math is. Like, okay, I'm gonna get five this this month, but the complexity of getting alignment, I feel like, is is you know underserved. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, you can do a little bit of filtering by having more information on your partner welcome page on your website to define like what you might be looking for from a partnership. Um, for, for us at Clyde, it's like really nuanced because we need to not only make sure that that new agency partner will have enough clients that the juice will be worth the squeeze, but also that their clients are in a particular industry that we are able to serve because we are so niche. So for instance, we need to make sure that um, they either have clients that are in home furnish. Clyde is an extended warranty platform. I know I didn't mention that earlier, but um, we do insurance technology. So we offer like product protection and um, extended pl plans uh, or extended warranties for products um, through uh, retailers' websites. And so like they need to be in furniture or home goods or electronics. And so like we need to go through almost like an account mapping process with the agency in order to determine like, do we have a match here? Um, but then also I think, I don't, I'm, I'm of the opinion that I don't ever wanna shut the door in anyone's face. Like if you wanna to apply to be a, a partner, like obviously there's some, there might be something there. So if we determine that for some reason that you're not a uh, ideal partner, like what can we do with you in order to help you self-serve and be able to learn about our business and then figure out if you have a referral that you want to send to us, please do. We will take that all day. Um, and so for us, you know, I think there's the, the high touch, hold your hand approach. And then there's like the self-serve portal. And so I think the self-serve option is really where like PRMs come into play, where you could, uh, allow people to come in, apply, give them some access to some gated content and be able to like learn about um, your business through like an LMS or content that you have uploaded into the platform. This way, at least you give them some opportunity to work with you if you determine that you were probably going to disqualify them based on that initial conversation. Um, Ashley, I, I had a question in regards of, um, I guess, volume versus um, strategic. And if you believe that there's a, a world in which, particularly when you're starting an agency program, right? Like it could be like a hybrid model where you could start both having some strategic partners, but then also, you know, at the same time building volume. And then I guess from those results, then compare and contrast and then uh, see, you know, if you want to focus more on one or the other. Um, yeah. Yeah, just be protective of your time is like my my advice um the the larger strategic partners take a lot of time and effort to groom and onboard properly and it's not just like working with one point of contact it's finding multiple points of contact and threading the account so that you're working with this, you know several layers of people across different orgs within that agency because if you lose that one point of contact you spend all that time working on they move to a new company or they get acquired and they can't work with you anymore like Oh, it's all that effort out the window. Um, whereas with the, the volume-based partners, you might be able to have like one point of contact because they're smaller agencies, for instance, yeah. and that might be easier for you to just kind of explore at a faster rate without having like such a, an opportunity for like a massive loss if you were to lose your, your point of contact. Totally. Thank you. And also see how fast you can activate them. Right. Like if you're spending all this time banging your head against the wall with a strategic partner, because like you see this as a potential big opportunity for your business or for your channel um, and they're not giving you anything. But then those smaller partners are giving you fast wins, like chase the money. <laughs> you know, like I would I would then, you know, change the direction and go after those volume based partners and then slowly start to sprinkle um, and nurture the, the larger strategic accounts until you start to get your hooks in and start to see some returns from it. Um, actually, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so my question was like, uh, so I'm from George B and we faced something similar, right? Like, so we went all out, we hired a bunch of partners. Um, but what we realized, like we thought, like, you know, more to what Susan's been asking, right? Like we thought that hire more partners, 20% of them will drive revenue. But what we realized that if, 
there is no alignment with respect to actually driving revenue and commitment from them, uh, a lot of these partners become inactive. So do you have like this discussion um, during like during the recruitment phase itself that, you know, see which bucket they would fall in and unless and until and then, you know, have engagement according to that or like what is how is the expectation setting with your partners with respect to driving revenue and getting uh, deals? Yeah, that's a great question. And like I, I call those partners the zombie partners <laughs> um, because you wind up getting you signing up a ton of if you if you take the volume based approach, you sign up a bunch of partners and then you like kind of lose momentum with maybe the bottom third or bottom half of the portfolio. Um, what I've seen work in the past is some partner programs will opt to package the programs so that you have different tiers or levels within the program. And that sets the expectation that if you have revenue goals from each of those tiers, for instance, um, that that would then um, dictate how much effort and support that charge me would be providing you as a partner. But if you remain inactive and you're not um, you know, sending leads, for instance, then like they would get bumped down into like the next level of the tier or, you know, maybe even removed from the program, depending on your view. Um, yeah. I've also seen like partner, partner referral agreements that just expire after a year. So if you're worried about like partners that are just kind of sitting, not doing anything, um, if the paperwork expires after year one, then if they're not active, you're not dealing with a referral, um, with a renewal with that partner, you can just let them go at that point. For me, they don't do any damage. So like, if you're just a partner and you're not engaged, I'm just, our team is probably just not going to devote as much time and resources to you as they would to a partner that is engaged and like really active within our community. Got it. Ashley, how, how firm are you on setting those expectations up front? Like kind of related to my question before is like, is it, you know, hey, um, you get to bring in five deals a year to stay in this tier or stay in this program, like really setting them out. Like, because sometimes, it, it, you know, especially like working with agencies, I find like it tends to rub them the wrong way when you, you lead with like, what can you bring to the table right away? So it's like kind of the soft sell of like, well, we want you as a partner, we want to work with you, we want to develop this, you know, this industry or whatever, whatever it is. But at the same time, like we need you to deliver on this, this goal, this objective. Like what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's kind of like, do you, do you do the carrot or the stick approach? And I like the carrot. Um, which is like, all right, we're going to start out on equal ground today, but if you want to, for instance, receive referrals from us, then we need to see X. So we need to see you either complete our certification course, or you send us X number of referrals, or you participate in a webinar, whatever the, those benchmarks are, um, set them and make them achievements rather than a penalty. Um, because then you have a basis of like getting engaged or like, hey, you, you know, it's been six months, you haven't delivered on X, Y, Z. Um, what can we do to move this forward without having those benchmarks kind of preset ahead of time? You really have no visibility into are they performing or they not, other than like, are they bringing us customers or not, which, you know, um, doesn't give you the whole picture, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there is also like, the whole FOMO <laughs> approach, which is um, when you're talking to a new potential partner, highlighting a successful partner and suggesting like how many deals you guys have done together or some of the things that you've done together or met benchmarks that they've hit. Be like, we're really excited about our relationship with Hawk Media because we've done like a webinar, we've participated in their events, they've sent us 10 referrals in the last six months. Like uh, I made all those numbers up, but nonetheless, like kind of put the put a partner on a pedestal and get the person that you're speaking with hyped up about what they need to do to to be in a similar position. I love it. That's actually a good one. I think the FOMO approach usually works in any way. You just there's a fine balance, I guess, between like, yeah, but it's good. Thank you. Sure. Hey Ashley, quick question. So do you usually tier your um, agency partners? Uh, and how long does it usually take you to 
ramp them up to the level of productivity? And do you take that into consideration uh, as far as uh, setting the goals for the initial starting period? Um, I have mixed feelings about the tiers, to be honest. Um, at least in our, our the partnerships journey at Clyde, I'm actually more interested in taking a persona-based approach at first, because we're in the in the infancy stages of building out the partner program. So what I don't want to do is be that tech partner that sets up unrealistic goals and expectations to be to reach within each of those tiers. I'd rather like take some time up front and like build out uh, different program profiles for like a digital agency that just wants to refer, maybe one that wants to get certified and become an implementation partner. Um, and then maybe you just want to be like a, a friend that creates some content about a topic that is in our industry and maybe you're just a brand ambassador or an affiliate of sorts. So we did package the partner program um, and set up tiers when I was at Trustpilot, but that was after three years of proving out the concept, knowing what the proper expectations and goals would be for a new partner. Um, and we felt, I felt pretty confident about what we were asking of our partners um, because we had you know, history to look back upon. Great. Does that so, answer? Yeah, sort of, uh, I guess, you know, those were leading questions trying to figure out how you set the goals to determine um, the success of your agency partner or or do you just let it, um, you know, do you just see where where the revenue is coming from and and then start tiering them, which is which is what it sounds like to me at this point where you're just starting. Yeah. Well, so we are just getting started at Clyde. Um, here's here's my opinion. I actually would rather put KPIs on our team than on the partner. Um, I think that behavior drives results and that if we were to put our best foot forward to focus on onboarding that agency and training them and making sure they have a delightful experience with our team, that the results will follow. Um, so at least in the early stages of our program, we are focusing more on putting like putting the, um, the weight on our shoulders to lift our partners up to make them successful. And that's where like, I think some part, partner programs fail because they are so like me, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. And that's great if you're like a major organization, if you're like, you know, Adobe or Salesforce or, you know, a major company or Shopify where you have like all the power <laughs> in the relationship. Um, but, you know, running around with your hand out, asking agencies to send you referrals without really giving them enough back, um, I think is what is creating this dynamic where agencies have like a sour taste in their mouth about working with tech partners. So that's how we're planning to differentiate our, our program at Clyde, which is like, we want to make sure that we are taking the time to educate and enable our partners. And like, I'm confident that the results will come. I don't feel like we need to set boundaries and expectations for the partners, at least not in this stage of our journey. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. Like just one more question. So, so how do you set revenue goals for these partners? Right? Like I, I really um, understand your point that, you know, it's not just the revenues that the partner is giving, but also how much they're engaging with you, how many activities they do together. And we are taking a similar approach in charge as well. But like, uh, but like you would have revenue goals for each of these partners and how long would you wait like um, to see, say, you know, they are engaging with you in other aspects, but you're not really seeing much results with respect to revenue. How long would you wait before, you know, you move on to the next? Yeah, I guess you would have to really diagnose the problem. Um, and I would take a look to see, are they not delivering because they're sending leads that are not a good fit? Like they're, we're DQing the referrals that they're sending to us. Um, in which case that might be a symptom of just not no match on ICP, 
right? Like maybe we, their clients just aren't a good fit for us. Um, in which case we should probably not invest as many, as much resources into that, into developing that partner. Um, are they just not sending any leads at all? Well, like, what are we doing to build that engagement with that, with that agency? And like, what could we be doing more to get them more interested in working with us? And then there's also situations where like, these guys are busy. You're not like the only thing going on in their life. So like, sometimes, you know, shit just happens and you just need to like, kind of continue to nurture that account, continue to nurture the partner, maybe with some like automation, whether it's a drip campaign that you're sending out to them or you're engaging with them on social and just like let them breathe a little bit. Yeah, and like easy wins I find work really well too, like giving them like an easy win, like even if it's like a, you know, hey, we're doing this like like webinar, like love for you to join me, bring a couple of your customers in. Uh, I think, you know, you're brands or whatever it is like just give them something like you can engage with easily because a lot of times it's, it's really just about attention span right like they're running an agency they're not running a, a resale resale network yeah or like ghost them an email or a linkedin note that they can just send to the client um so that they can just like copy paste and send it um one of the things that you know we did often in my former role is we would take a look at like your, we do account mapping and we would take a look at who are some of the top five best fit clients that would be a good fit um, for our, for our brand. And then we would build out like a whole cadence of emails that they could send to them as well as like mock-ups. Um, we'd point out like the value props or pain points that we'd be able to solve for and really like empower the agency to be able to go back to the client and be like, hey, you guys should work with these guys because, and we notice X, Y, and Z, and like put them in a position to be like the thought leader in the room um, and not have to like compile all of that themselves. Yeah. But you want to just like pivot onto the next topic here, which is partner recruitment, because I realized that we're 40 minutes into the session um and i'm on yeah, actually, slide. i did to let everybody know that we're going to share your deck and uh, and the recording so and uh, it's funny that we're running out of time because we had a conversation earlier about this is like i think this is a two-part session because like there's just so much to, to get through so yeah keep going but we'll we'll figure out if we, if we run out of time yeah so these can probably be like some snackable sized tips on partner acquisition um when I transitioned from being a seller to a partnerships manager, I had no book of business. Um, same deal when you come into a new role, unless you, you're able to bring contacts with you, which I was very fortunate to do uh, at Clyde. Um, but what really helped me get a fast start was to survey our, the existing customer base to ask them, who are you working with? Who are your current agencies that you're working with? And one, like, who are they? And two, would you make an introduction? And I did that uh, at Trustpilot and I got 300 leads. And those aren't just any leads for new partners. These are like the good leads. These agencies were already engaged with our customers. So it made the outreach to them so much easier. And like the response rate was incredible. Um, from that initial send, I believe I signed 35 new agency partners that became like really long-term top performing partners that I know are still working with them today. Um, so take a look at like who's in the room and start shaking hands with the folks that are already engaging with your, with your shared, with a shared client or with your brand. Um, and then like going back to what I was saying earlier about making best friends with the sales team. I think there's always like, are we friends? Are we foes? Um, <laughs> but like one of the things that I found to be really successful to not only um, make sure that we were aligned in working with and how an agency can work with the, an open opportunity or work with a prospect that we were talking to, um, we I trained the sales teams to do active discovery around like who is your agency as part of their exploratory calls and then share that information uh, with the partner team. And so from there, we would reach out to that agency if the, if the prospect wouldn't uh, create an, or send an introduction and putting the subject line of just your business name and then the other business, the prospect's business name or the client's business name in the subject line was like, 
I had such an insane response rate because the agency would see that somebody's talking to their client and they're like, oh my God, I need to know what's going on. Um, so this was like a, just a quick template that I put together. Um, it's obviously like very short and sweet, uh, but it's just saying like, hey, I noticed that our team is talking to your client and I would just love to like take some time to tell you about what we're doing, what we're chatting about and educate you on how we could do it better together and use that same format in LinkedIn outreach and via email. And it was a great way to bring on new partners. And then also for us as a partner team to be able to get deal assists on open ops. So like bringing the partner in to help bring that deal to close would also give the partner team attribution uh, for any opportunities where we're able to help influence that through an agency. Um, and then to go beyond like just surveying which agencies are already working with your current customers, taking a look at like what is in their tech stack. So for instance, being in e-commerce, we would take a look at like who are the top platforms that our customers are building their websites on and then who are some of the ISVs that are, they're also working with and then expand and use that as a, as a driver for new partner acquisition. So we'd look at like, who are some of the top Shopify partners? Cause everybody that works with us is on Shopify or like everyone uses Klaviyo for email marketing. Maybe we should take a look at all the agencies that are associated with Klaviyo's um, partner program. And so like, then now you're to starting to build like that ecosystem. And if your organization is not in charge of tech partners, it's a great way to also bring all the partnerships folks together with one common goal of building out a program that touches the agency, the ISVs and the platforms as well. And, there, and the great thing about this, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but all these agencies are happily listed on these partner directories as well. So it's an easy way to be able to source new partners um, or alternatively, like we've also used the website clutch.co. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, it's a great resource uh, to be able to find new partners. You can sort by like what their customer looks like, whether they're SMB, mid-market or enterprise, you can find contact information there and case studies and sometimes even banner client names as well. So that was a great resource for my team. Um, Evan, did we go the full hour? I'm taking that as a yes, but you're yeah. on mute. It's 15 minutes. Okay, yeah, 15 cool. Minutes. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about like the onboarding journey for a new agency. There is a big long dance. It's a whole like dating process of getting them from the first discovery call to like completing the onboarding flow. Like until you've got the signed contract, you've got a deal one, you're starting to put them into like an ongoing nurture campaign. Um, I put up, put together kind of like a quick, you know, these are some of the milestones for new partner acquisition. Um, and so what I was noticing is that, you know, my team would get a new agency into the, into the um, discovery phase, have a discovery call with them. We would schedule like an onboarding I'm sorry, we schedule like a team training event. Uh, and then we would just kind of like let them run off and hopefully come back to us with a referral by sending them like ongoing nurture campaigns and catch up calls, et cetera. And so part of um, kind of like our flow was we had the discovery call. So super important to understand, you know, who, what that agency is like core competencies are, what it motivates them, what are their goals from the partnership, et cetera. Um, the next stage being, let's get a referral agreement in place or an NDA, whichever, you know, floats your fancy. And then the, the next process was the partner lunch and learn. And so rather than coming in with a generic demo on that demo, like with just a generic examples, one thing that really helped us to accelerate getting that first referral underway is to just ask for it on that first call and say, Hey, I'm going to come, I'm going to come in and do a product demo for your team. Um, and in that demo, we would actually walk them through what our sales team did in order to prospect new business and like what kind of pain points we looked out for. 
So we would just ask the agency, like in that next call, who's a client that you think would be a good fit for us? And I'll use them as the example and we'll rip them apart on that product demo and show them like all the areas where our technology would be able to help them be better. And so rather than waiting for that and you know, hoping and praying for that referral to come after we completed like the lunch and learn and we had a bunch of other calls, we we're getting referrals in the first call. And like, it was incredible. And then on top of it, in that exercise, we were arming the whole company with all the value props that they would need to be able to bring that back to the client to then make the introduction. So that was kind of an aha moment for us. I think we can all agree. Celebrate the wins. <laughs> uh, this is a fairly generic uh, slide, but um, I do want to emphasize the importance of incentivizing of thanking the individual that drove the referral. Like the, we have rev share agreements with the agencies. Some choose to split that and give that to the individual that sends the referral to you, but we don't, we as tech partners don't dictate, you know, how they want to incentivize their account managers. And so we actually moved into like a, a spiff and bonus program in my previous role where we were incentivizing the individuals. And we saw one agency go from a trickle of one to three referrals per quarter to like seven to nine per month because we were giving individuals like 50 bucks, Amazon gift cards, gift baskets, whatever the case might be. Like we switched it up month over month and like I couldn't believe how effective that was. There's like gifting platforms out there that you could use, whether it's like Sendoso or like, I don't know, Alice maybe um, that can automate that for you. And like, ugh, it was, sounds so simple, but you know, I built, I'm building that into my budget um, in my, in, for the partner program at Clyde. This is a beefy one. <laughs> um, so we've been going through an evaluation to uh, find some tech to help us to be able to onboard agencies faster. Um, being partner teams, we are more oftentimes than not tiny teams and we need to be nimble um, and we oftentimes are fighting for resources. And so um, using a tool like a PRM or email marketing or HubSpot or whatever the case might be to automate the process for new partners to come in, raise their, raise their hand, say, I want to be a partner, be able to enable our teams to be able to accept or deny that partner with a single click. Um, and then allowing them access to the portal so they can like download content and start to refer us business. Um, with very minimal interaction with the team. And this was very much like going into a volume-based approach versus you know, big, bringing on less, more strategic partners. Um, but this was part of the business case that I had developed for uh, purchasing a PRM. So showing like at the top, um, every dark yellow mark is a touch point from a partner manager. And this is the flow from prospect inbound, so raising their hand to be a partner, to the first referral. And then on the bottom, it's showing, you know, we took that from what, three, six, nine, 10 touch points down to two, down to two, potentially one. At what point, Ashley, would you could give a recommendation to consider a, a PRM platform? Like how like any like ballpark number of agencies already onboarded where you're just like, all right, it makes sense. Oof, it's a heavy question. Um, I think there's a <laughs> lot of <laughs> varying opinions on that. For me, I think this is part of our core go to market plan for onboarding and supporting partners. So like, I don't care how many partners we have. If we have zero partners, I'm still going to sign up, sign a, a PRM and implement that because I know it's going to help my team be faster and be, be able to do their jobs more efficiently um, in the long term. So yeah, I don't know. It's rather than like waiting for a breaking point where everybody's like ripping their hair out because they have too many partners to manage and they can't keep up with all of their accounts. Um, so I... I'm of the mindset that I want to get ahead of it before, you know, reacting to a situation where my team is, you know, struggling to keep up. 
Do you have a favorite PRM or like a selection of your, let's say top three? I've looked at a bunch um, and at this point, not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I've looked at a, a variety of them uh, and have for the last couple of years. I think each PRM has their own levels of specialty and price points. For me, it was most important to find one that gave a really positive user experience to the customer because as somebody in partnerships, like sometimes I just like hate logging a lead. I hate going into the <laughs> platform. <laughs> I hate having to deal with it. It's a clunky experience. And I'm, I'm sorry to ask partners to do that and have that experience with us. Um, but at the same time, it does so many things like being able to send welcome like nurture campaigns and being able to tell me how effective our partners are being. And so I've looked at InPartner, Allbound, mm -hmm. and Partner Stack. And for us, uh, I think it made the most sense to go with a platform that like people were used to. And I thought that our team could use and implement quickly. So we chose to go forward with Partner Stack. Um, I can't say that that is the, my endorsement for everyone, sure. uh, but for us, I felt like that was the right selection at this point. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip over, well, let's see what we have seven minutes. I think this is pretty straightforward, but one thing that really floored me this week is we got an email from an agency that was introduced to us, um, that he was so prepared. He had a template that said, here's what I'm looking for. Here's about us. Here's what I can give you as a partner. And here's what other partners are saying about me. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this guy knows what he wants, but also like, you know, it was great to know what they wanted so that we could determine like if we can offer what they're looking for from us, which was co-marketing opportunities, a listing in our partner directory. They want referral revenue from us um, and backlinks and content. Uh, so being able to include them in like website or in our blog uh, and other areas where, you know, we're pushing thought leadership out. And then from my side, I was like, oh, we should do this. So like as a tech partner, you know, having a similar, here's what I bring to the table, um, sort of template to send to new partners, like after that first initial handshake. Um, but I just think it's really important to just understand like who you're speaking with, like what are their goals, not only as a company, but also as an individual. So I always ask, you know, new folks like account managers, like what are you focused on this quarter? And like, how can I help you get there? And it just, it seems, really basic, but like humanizing the process rather than saying like, let's just send each other referrals. Um, I don't know. I think it just helps build stronger rapport uh, and stick your clients or stick your partners rather. And this is my last, my last piece, my last slide, which is the partnership business case. So this was huge for us. Um, I could probably do a whole session on this, but I realize we only have five minutes, so I'll just give you the teaser. Um, put, putting together a deck that was somewhat generic in nature, but had um, certain slides that were tailored to that specific agency. And the thought being that we have typically a champion that we work with on day-to-day -day operations, right? We have that one person, whether an account manager or the client, you know, he oversees client success and they need to be able to tell the folks at their organization who you are as a partner and what the value of that partnership is. And to have like a kind of a single source of truth where they can upload that into whether it's an internal wiki or if they're using some kind of um, like I don't know, guru or something similar where they keep track of uh, partner information that they can just plug this and have it all in one spot. So they were typically just shared Google Docs, Google Slides, and it was, let's tell you about the joint opportunity. So here's what Clyde brings to you as an agency. Here's what you as an agency brings to Clyde, followed by um, one or two kind of overview slides from us. I would ask for two of, of the same from them. Um, the account mapping results, so who are our shared clients, who are clients that we're going after, 
Um, and then a couple of supplemental documentation, like our integration docs and discovery questions that they could ask their clients to position um, our solution on their calls. And like, this was amazing. This, I know it sounds really basic, but also applied this to our tech partner program as well, because like with tech partners, you have a whole committee of people that need to weigh in. Like, are we going to do, you know, an integration? Are we going to do co-marketing? Are we going to post them on our blog? And then somebody's like, who's this partner? I've never heard of them. And it's like, just check out the business case. And it was, <laughs> it made my life so much easier for everyone to better understand like who that partner was, what their value was to us. And then on this flip side of that, empower them to do the same on their end. So the business case. <laughs> I, love it. I think we're going to, we might have to do a part two on this because I think, yeah, there's so much importance in this. I mean, it's hard to, it's almost like, uh, you know, making a business plan when you're kind of getting on a new journey it's kind of painful to do it in the, in, in the beginning um because you're you're kind of actioning it yourself but it's going to save you so much time like going forward on and on and on so uh we might have to do a session on this one i think this is super interesting cool yeah i'd be happy to um we've got a few more uh questions or uh, minutes if uh, if anybody has got a, a couple questions um shoot how are you doing account mapping? I use Crossbeam. Um, I've in the past we just did it with uh, Google Docs and just did use a V lookup. Um, Crossbeam's been a bit of a game changer. How are you approaching that, Ashley? Like with with Cross, like are you letting the partners know, like, hey, this is what we need you to do to be a partner of ours? Like, is it an optional thing? Or is it like, hey, if you want to be a partner with us, you get it, we've got to do some mapping. Uh, it's not mandatory, but, well, it wasn't um, when I was at Trustpilot, because it was more measuring the opportunity. Um, one of the things that we I've found successful is to say, hey, if we are able to do account mapping, I can I can say with it, it is very likely that we will have a stronger partnership together because we know what we're pursuing together and what those joint opportunities could look like right at the get go. But if you if you need to put us in a position where we as your partner are kind of like operating in a black box, we can't help you properly plan. And like if we knew what accounts you were talking to or who you were working with, we can support you with specific documentation and support resources to be able to raise the conversation with them and position you as an expert. So yeah, um, we just swapped like who the client was based on the website that was kind of our shared data point. Um, but then we also included data points like online revenue, what platform they were using, what industry they were in. Um, and anything else that, you know, would be relevant specifically to, you know, to you to qualify the app. Great. Awesome. Cool. Anybody, anybody uh, got another question? We've got a minute here if uh, anybody wants to shoot one. All right. Um, so we're going to, we're going to make this recording available for you guys uh, and the deck and we'll, I'll talk to Ashley about doing a, maybe a part two, maybe even next week. We'll see. Ooh. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, Ashley. Thank you very much for, for an amazing session. And uh, if there are, like I said, if there are any questions, uh, we can take it onto the Slack as well. And Ashley, myself, and some of the other advisors will be happy to answer them. So th thanks for joining us. So um, great session last week. I think there was a lot of really good questions um, that you know got me thinking, and I'm happy to chat through this. You know, once we kind of run through things uh, once more, just as a quick recap, um, last week's session we talked about launching and activating an agency partner program um, with hopefully speed and efficiency, um, and I shared a couple of tactics that. Uh, we had deployed while I was at Clyde and some of the things that we are also working on here at, sorry, at Trustpilot and now at Clyde. Um, so I'm going to skip through my personal background since we've already met um, and jump into some of the, the topics that we discussed. So, you know, first it was preparing for launch. So, you know, what are some of the KPIs that you as the partner team are focused on in those first 30 days and 
how are we going to define success, you know, over the course of the next year, two years, three years, um, and really defining who, what kind of partners we're going to be pursuing and what that ideal partner profile looks like for your company. Um, we jumped into you know quick ways to be able to identify partners that could be not only already within your customers' ecosystems, um, but also that would be really sticky and eager to want to work with you. Um, I think one thing that can be a potential pitfall of working with agencies is competing level of priorities, right? Like these guys have their day-to-day -day operations going on. Um, they'll take time to maybe learn about you and your business and your company, but like getting them to actually like engage with you and be able to be in a position where they're ready to refer business takes a lot of you know time, effort, and trust to get to that point. So one of the things that you know, we, we did while I was at Trustpilot when I was just getting started building the partner program there and something that we're also going to be rolling out here at Clyde is surveying who's in the room, right? So sending out even like a, a email or a survey monkey type of survey that's asking your current customers, who are the agencies that they're currently working with and how can we, might we be able to start uh, reaching out to them if they're comfortable with that uh, to, you know, shake hands, kiss babies, introduce uh, our solution to their team and figure out how we could work better together to deliver the most value to our shared client. And when we had done this um, in the past, I saw something to the tune of 300 new partner leads on the first survey. And something that we rolled out consistently, you know, six months, uh, every six months, just to get like kind of the new the new uh, partner leads from the current cu the customers that we had onboarded most recently. Uh, the second tactic was uh, building a relationship with your commercial facing and merchant or customer facing teams to uh, put them in a position to be able to uncover who their agencies are that they're currently working with, you know, during the sales cycle and if they're a new business rep or you know, customer agencies that might surround current customers and how we could identify that during the onboarding process. Uh, this was a template, we'll be sharing the PDF of the presentation uh, after this if Evan hasn't already done so. Um, but this was you know, just kind of a quick thing that I drafted up, um, which was a template that we were using uh, to reach out to those agencies once they were uncovered by the commercial teams. And making sure that it comes off as like, you know, we are here to deliver more value to a shared customer and we want to help you help them. Um, and one of the things that we found to be irresistible for encouraging like a high response rate from that outreach was putting the com our company name and the name of the client that we are talking to because we found that, you know, the agencies wanted to know who we were talking to at their, at their client and what kind of conversations were we having and how could that potentially impact uh, their business, their relationship with them and their KPIs. Um, and then expanding beyond not only the agencies that are working with our teams, um, but also like what technologies are popping up most often and what partner programs could those agencies be participating with those technologies. So for instance, like Clavio has a really strong email marketing and agency partner program. If Clavio is common in your customer's tech stack, then maybe it makes sense to start branching out and prospecting new agencies that already work with Clavio. Um, I want to open up and, and make sure that we're spending time on the Q&A portion of this. So uh, a couple, just to touch hot, like at a high level in the next couple of slides, talking about how we could speed up the onboarding process um, for the, from the first discovery call with agencies and then uh, accelerating that to the first referral, uh, celebrating the first referral and the first wins, uh, and then how we can accelerate like the onboarding process through using technology, whether that's a PRM, email marketing or other marketing automation tools to help to onboard them at scale and reduce the amount of touch points that an individual partner manager has to, has to um, manage uh, in order to get them from discovery to activation. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the things is, as technology partners to these solution agencies and solution partners is really like 
taking time to understand what their goals are. And I think there is a, a tendency for us to just jam our value prop around like why our, our company is so awesome down their throat and not necessarily tailoring it away that um, helps our partners understand why they, you know, or how they would be able to benefit from partnering with us. So I think that is critical, uh, not only to, to help uh, paint the picture of the shared value prop, but then also to get them invested uh, in, you know, working with you and maybe not your competitors. And then the business case. And this was a big, long uh, topic that I think we could probably <laughs> spend a whole hour on, if not um, at another time, but happy to dig into this as well. Uh, which was the shared presentation of sorts that our team builds and shares with our partners. And then it kind of becomes a living document where we share our account mapping results, the value prop, the integration documentation, if that is something that is relevant. This way that everyone at the other side of the partner org could better understand what this partnership means for the business and like help the partner manager or the point of contact that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, help to evangelize the partnership uh, internally. And we saw a ton of success uh, using this format as well. Um, so that was that, kind of the that's, summary. That's, that's the recap. Uh, that was yeah. almost like a, another presentation. That was, that was great. Uh, <laughs> we do need to do a session on that last, uh, last piece of it. I feel like that could be branded as a, as a tactic alone. There's, there's definitely some value there, but yeah, anybody, um, yeah. Uh, open for, for questions here. If anybody, um, wants to jump in, I've got a few here myself as well. I, I do have a question on, um, you, when you talked about the survey, which I think is a great idea. Um, were you talking about sending these to current clients, um, current partners, or what is it like a target list of partners that you wanted to kind of reach out to? So the survey was to existing customers, our existing customers. And it was just, we worked with our customer marketing team to send out a, a survey via email, just being like, you know, partnerships is a team sport and we want to know who the players are. Like, we would love to talk with your agency and help you with onboarding, help you deliver like the, or extract the most value out of our platform. Would you be open to sharing some more information about, you know, who you currently partner with and are you okay with us engaging with them and their team? I think we threw like a, you know, a raffle, like a $200 Amazon gift card along with it for a response. Um, and we- That was my next question. <laughs> had a really, yeah, it was a really high uh, response rate. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I think that that um, that survey part is really neat. Like even when I, when I was at Proposify, we did uh, we did at least like once a quarter. It wasn't a survey, but it was some sort of call to action on like, hey, are you working with clients that could use A, B, or C? We'd love to partner. Can we show value? Like giving them a reason to kind of reach out uh, to the partner team and, and talk about how we can go to market or go to a customer or whatever the case is. And like, you look at like sending something like that to 20, 30, 40, 50,000 customers, like you're going to get some really solid partner leads and it doesn't really take away from what you're trying to accomplish, like at, from, for, for them as a customer. So it's kind of like an add on. It's like, Hey, we want to work with you more. Like we want to work with you more strategically. And it's either like immediately like, Oh no, like that's not what we do. And that's fine. Like they keep going along the day, but the ones that you know, those light bulbs do go off. They're like, oh yeah, totally. And they'll respond. You get, you know, a few hundred leads, like you said, and, you know, out of those probably, you know, 10, 15 will convert to like really good partners. And you do that once a quarter, that's quite a pipeline, right? And it's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit. And then it, it, those partners that we got from those surveys tended to be the most sticky and the most active because we already had a shared customer. So we had a shared interest. And then we could use that as a proof point to say, like, here's the shared success that we worked on with this particular customer. And now we had a case study that that partner could then use internally to drive more interest and more business uh, back to us. How many customers did you uh, send the survey to approximately to get 300 um, responses? Yeah, I think it was 4,000. Okay. If not three. But it was yeah, you know, like, was, so like, which, you know, whether it's like, oh, we're looking for partners in this region, like we're looking for partners in Chicago, or we're looking at partners in London, we'll pull the customer base out of that location or surrounding areas and send a survey only to those. 
it's not really a blast like the entire customer base just be a little more strategic about who you send it to right because like you and will like get a big response yeah and when you're sending it so we did this you know initially to all us based customers because we were like screw it we want all we want to know what's going on we want to know who we can start you know building the portfolio with um but then we tried to incorporate it into the onboarding flow so it's important to wait until that customer is set up and they're having a positive experience with the team because we got some funny responses in the survey i'm not gonna lie some of which were like why are you asking me this and i won't tell you and um yeah so you get a mixed bag <laughs> but timing yeah is- you're gonna get that for sure and even just like any survey you're gonna get the bad with the ugly and all that stuff and it's like how much of it do you want to go through that's why having such a huge blast you got to be ready to go through a like three four hundred responses like somebody's actually going to go through those one by one and some of those dictate actually getting on a call so is are you willing to get on 300 calls to qualify um because it's a partnership it's not a yeah like it's not just you know it's not an easy easy win um it need, needs time and development right that's a good point about incorporating into the onboarding process for sure right just a steady continuous flow as new customers come on, you just making it a part of that process is key. But man, it's just a continuous new new data points every month, hopefully, you know, from your AM team. Yeah, I mean, and and then figuring out how to get the AM team built uh, bought in on that. Also, like, I think it took us about a year to collect enough data from the agency program to say, this is how much it's impacting our win rate or our time to onboarding or our retention rate, because obviously we need to go a full cycle of renewal. Um, but once we had that, the, the CS team was like, oh shit, like it's 14% or 15% more likely that this customer is going to renew because there's a partner involved and it's, they have a stake in the renewal. So like, I think, showing like the why me aspect internally, both to like a new biz rep or to a customer success or account manager will also help to get more uh, buy-in from the internal orgs to give you more of those referrals. So with CS, I know you, um, I know you work with um, I know at TrustPile you, you did a campaign, uh, if I remember correctly around, you know, um, kind of creating some sort of um, reward for identifying potential partners within the existing customer pool. So are you doing a similar thing now? Or like, can you kind of just give us a rundown of kind of what, what how you structured that and what value you saw out of it? Yeah, there's a couple of ways to incentivize and motivate. Uh, let's start with Nubis. Um, if you have budget and cash, which you may not if you're just building out the partner program. That's you know a great way to incentivize somebody on a new biz team to say, hey, if you send us a referral or even CS, you send us a referral, we send it to the partner, that, that deal closes. Like we could either give you a spiff for sometimes sales qualified lead, like if the partner says this was a fit, um, the meeting happened, and then even offer a bonus for like a close one opportunity. Because in many cases, if you're taking a rev share from that partner, you know, that's stuff that you could either reallocate into the partner budget, um, or I've seen other, you know, partner programs just like split that and give part of the rev share back to the rep, um, or all of it in some cases, depending on, you know, how you want to structure that. For me, when I was just getting started with the, with the program at Trustpilot, like I didn't have budget. So instead of saying, I'm going to give you a financial incentive, I said, you send me a lead, I send you a lead. And so I was able to build enough uh, relationships with the sales team where I had like a core group of reps that were like, they understood the value of getting a partner referral and like they were sending me referrals. And then they knew that I would get the first referral I got from that partner would go right back to them. So it's kind of like a give and take uh, relationship and it worked really well. Nice. What kind of volume? You're fighting over it. <laughs> what kind of volume were you going through it? Like, I'm just thinking, like, were you just using like an Excel sheet to be like, okay, like this person's next, or you know, like, how are you kind of managing that? Yeah, um, 
it, so we call this our first five. So it was actually, if you send me a partner, they sign up as a partner, then I give you the first five referrals from that partner. So we tracked that in Salesforce and we would add who the rep was that introduced the partner and then keep track of all the related opportunities that were then sent uh, back to that rep. In some cases, that account might already be owned by another sales rep or by you know a BDR who's putting outreach on it. So we kind of had to navigate that at points depending on how engaged or how far along they were with the opportunity because um, there would be a big emotional response. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. if they're like, oh, you sent my lead to another rep, um, especially when the partner referral win rates were, I don't know, 75%. Wow. versus the floor average, which was much lower. Um, so uh, and then in terms of volume, once the program started picking up, we went round robin early, early on, started with the enterprise sales team. Um, then we moved into like round robining with the sales managers. Um, and then it became like we had a dedicated team that was supporting partner referrals. Uh, so that you were had to be of a, a certain uh, level within the sales org to receive them from us. Hmm. That's really neat. The awesome. partner team wasn't like closing our own partner referrals. Right. We're still sending them out to sales. Um, any other questions, guys? Actually, um, if, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead no, Bradley, go, please. Oh, okay. With Trustpilot, was it sold as a retainer service in and of itself? Um, and if if not, do you think that there's a different way your product is pitched? If it's not like, hey, here's a service, you can sell it as a retainer. Because I think we're all kind of, you know, HubSpot is always this kind of top of mind um, you know, re retainer based service where it makes it's, it's so easy to understand. Oh, yeah, you, you know, you can. It's very easy to, to see how that's offered as a retainer service. But did, did your products kind of qualify themselves as retainer? And if not, like, how do you position it? Like, how did you get that buy in to utilize your tool if it's not that retainer service? Yeah, in and of itself. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah, totally. Um, I think there's product, there's uh, technology that leans itself to having like an implementation aspect to it, where like you could you could show your partners that they could win and have more services or retainers around your product because they were implementing or building on it. And then there's others where it's like, all right, well maybe there isn't an implementation opportunity because it's so easy to get started with that tool. Right. <laughs> So like that's that was the the situation with Trustpilot because like anyone could get started with it. It took you know my grandmother could set up the the tool. We didn't need implementation partners unless they were leaning towards more of the enterprise spectrum. So we t we the value that we were adding to an agency was that we were accelerating marketing performance because we were helping with reputation and we were placing trust marks throughout the customer journey that was getting more traffic to come to their websites because we put stars on their ads or stars, stars in Google search, or we put testimonials on their website, which helped to increase the conversion on the leads that the agency was driving for the business or the, you know, the, perf the overall like budget and performance of the campaign was just operating more efficiently and therefore they were saving money for the client. And so like, and then at the bottom, at the end of the day, if your reputation looks like, you know, poor, if your reputation looks poor, you spend all this money to get a customer to review or to find your business. And then they go to search for reviews on you and you look bad, like you're throwing money out the window. So we just tailored the value prop in a way to help the agency understand like why we're helping them, even though it wasn't a retainer service. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you, you got to kind of work through what is the, the why me in the partnership value prop. Ben, did you have a question? Um, yeah, mine was just a bit more of a, a general one, really. Um, I mean, I know we're going to chat soon, Ashley, as well, and, and connect. Um, 
and and I'd, you know I'm going to be really excited to speak more specifically about shopping gives and Clyde but um, I'm pretty new to this role so I've been brand facing actually in my last role um, with another company and I came into shopping gives to start the agency partnerships and 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 actually tech partnerships have been way more forthcoming um, just because of the space we're in and what we're kind of navigating towards. Um, my question is though, what, what have you used to, you know, your launching programs and what technology are like kind of, you know, your go-tos to, to kind of set the stall out in regards to just mapping, um, you know, all the things that's required for the agency um, partnership programs um, because, you know, through discovery, you kind of see them all. And it's like, well, you know, I need the essentials. <laughs> so for many, many things, you know? <laughs> yeah. You mean in terms of tech that you could? Yeah. Yeah. Tech that, that kind of helps you, you know, with your workflows and, and kind of process of, of lead tracking perhaps, or just, you know, getting an agency on board, but then, you know, referrals and everything else like that. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of moving parts in, in the program. There is. Um, and I think you, there's, I'm, I'm always more conservative when it comes to buying tech. I think that it's usually pretty standard that the new biz teams often have a lot of what we need, like using a tool like outreach or sales Loft to power like partner outreach, for instance, um, Salesforce, obviously to keep track of everything, but then partner specific for, for us, I think it was really important that we had a PRM because we're going for volume in addition to um, focusing on partner enablement and education. So finding a tool that can help us do that at scale and also deliver a delightful experience instead of making that like horrible because as a person in partnerships, I've had a lot of like partner portals where I had to log in and I'm like, oh God, I don't wanna do this. <laughs> so like, how can you make that experience positive? for your partners, they want to go in to do that. Um, so, you know, a PRM and then the, we just signed with also the company called Partner Page, which powers partner directories and makes it really easy for the partner team to own that piece of real estate on the website. Because if you let the marketing team build the directory, then you have to go through them every time you want to add a new partner. And then it's, you know, it makes it difficult. And I thought that they just had a really simple solution for that, so. Um, yeah, they kind of yeah, monopolize that market space. I'm cool yeah. with it. It it, it yeah, does everyone the job. Needs to have it, right? <laughs> um, and then account mapping. So there, I think there's a couple of solutions out there. For a very long time, we just used Excel at Trustpilot, and then we built um, our own account mapping software before I think account mapping software existed. Right. Um, just using like web hooks and like our, our data insights tool. And then I think, you know, Crossbeam has a really nice solution. I think what's the other one, ShareWork? ShareWork, yeah. 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 Um, so you get a lot ShareWork of- ShareWork is actually talking April 28th about what they did, not just about ShareWork, but what Simon did to create a account mapping practice at SAP and beyond and led to the software. So you should tune in for that as well. Nice, yeah. Okay. Cool, thank you. Uh, we've got uh, enough time for one more question if anybody's got one. Actually, I have a question, Ashley. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to run out and fix, deal with a guitar issue for my daughter. But uh, we're talking about surveying the customers. I've, I've long suspected, uh, also known because my own work, uh, the shadow channel, like when you surveyed your customers to find how many agencies they have, it was a lot. Uh, you got, even that was only people who responded, it was still a lot. Uh, was that <laughs> surprising to you or did you expect it to be that high? It was surprising. It was surprising. We also, we asked two questions in the survey, which helps. So we asked about who your digital agency is and then who your developer is. Mm. So we got a two for one. Um, so I don't know, I don't remember how many companies actually responded, but it was definitely 300 plus agencies. And yeah, I couldn't believe the, to the total number. I was like, oh no, now where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> they all said yes. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like having submissions. Like somebody's going to, like, yeah. or, like somebody's got to read these like proposals. Um, how many of those converted to like, you know, good partners? Um, so I think we had like 
30 or so that became like the cornerstone of the partner program and like super engaged, you know, top tier partners that are still, you know, kicking butt today. Here's a question for you that uh, I actually, we had this before with JotForm, the same thing. They have tens of thousands of companies doing this, but they only had like a hundred people in their partner program, kind of them as partners, but does it, does it really matter? Uh, uh, that's my question. If these kind of service companies are bringing Clyde into deals, whether or not they're talking to you or not, is that even more important that, that you win the marketing game? Um, and so the question I would have here is when you talk to these companies, you find out why they didn't want to be partners with you and what actually they needed with or without being a partner program to tell your story into their client deals, whether or not they're actually you know spending time on the phone with you every week. Because that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think it's really smart to make sure that you're not capitalizing too much of their time. So like kind of how fast can you get through that initial qualification process to determine if there's like buy-in from them um, and if there's even a, a fit. So yeah, I think doing discovery upfront is really important um, and also just figuring out what's important to them in terms of like goals and KPIs from the program. Do you find out why they didn't want to become a part of your partner program? Um, most times it was, eh, yeah, I'll just refer them and then like, they can just go do it. Like it was like, they just wanted to refer the business. They didn't want to take any cash, but, you know, rev share wasn't important to them. Um, for those that told me that though, instead of losing those partners, uh, over time, we were like, you know what, we're going to make two referral agreements. One is a rev share and one is a discount. So if you don't want to take rev share, we'll pass that along to the customer that you refer. But now we were able to find who those shadow partners were that were referring business to us because they were telling the client, tell them that I refer to you and you'll get X percent off or you'll get you know this, this deal. Um, Clever. Yeah, so, yeah, I think more oftentimes than not, it was competing priorities. It was, you know, they didn't want to take kickbacks or rev share and uh, they're like, yeah, no, you guys are good. Just Take the business. <laughs> awesome. All right. Kevin, I have um, one last quick question. One more, one more. I'm hiring a partner development rep. Does, do, do you by chance or does the CSA, Sunir, uh, and Evan, do you have a job, a, a template or a basic job description for a partner development rep? That Pop it in be... the channel. You'll find somebody who has one. Fair enough. I, I hired, I built that role out uh, before and I can you know add my two cents if it's of value. But I do have to jump because I have another meeting um, a few minutes behind four. But Bradley, I'm, ha <laughs> I'm happy to share. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, if there's any other questions, guys, just post it in the Slack channel. We'll get we'll get the answer. So anyway, thanks, awesome. Ashley, thanks for, Ashley. Uh, for your follow up and uh, thanks for joining, guys. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Right. Okay.